Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. My guest today is a man who was a friend of Frank Sinatra, a man who worked the room where Elvis, the Beatles, Muhammad Ali, and countless other stars performed. He is a legend in this city, yet the likelihood is you've never heard of him. He is a photographer, the official photographer of Madison Square Garden for the past 50 years. His name is George Kalinske. I first met George through my work with Frank Sinatra. George was one of Frank's favorite photographers. And if you know Frank Sinatra, that says a lot. There's that shot with a naked Bill Jackson like this. <laughs> I know Bill loves that shot. He knows when that moment is right. And the picture that he took of me was the in pose of a, a number that I did. And I think he is an incredible photographer that captures great moments. We will look at many of the great moments captured by George Kalinske next. I am so happy to welcome to the program George Kalinske. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Tony. It's really a pleasure to be here. Let's start at the very beginning. Um, my understanding is your interest, your earliest interest, was not in photography. It was in cartoons? I was a protege of Willard Mullen, who was a sports cartoonist. And Willard was the uh, cartoonist for the World Telegram and Sun. And when I was around 16, 17 years old, I used to go to his home in Manhasset, and he used to give me uh, pointers on how to be a better cartoonist. But he actually liked my work very much, and eventually I started doing sports cartooning for the Long Island Press. But I, I, I understand you, had, you always had a camera, even when you were a young kid, right? I always had uh, a camera with me because I, I like to look at arty things, arty things meaning fire escapes, cats, animals, um, anything that was uh, contrasty black and white. Mm -hmm. And my father once told me, he said, when you sweep a floor, you make money. If you become a photographer, you're not going to make a living. Really? He, he wanted you to be what? Something professional that well, he recognized? I, I grew as a up in the retail business, and mm -hmm. my father had a really good uh, juvenile furniture, toys, cribs uh, store. And I spent a lot of time in the store as I was growing up, and I learned a lot about business. And it was that kind of life was important to me, but. Um, I was trying to do something, or at least I was thinking about doing something more creative. Yeah. Photography wasn't it, but I love to draw, I love to do cartoons, and that's where I thought I was going to be. Your father wanted you to in the, in the retail my business. My father really wanted, wanted to take me over to the be business, in the right? store and to take over the business, but my brother has done a very good job of that. Yeah, and let's, we should thank him because... If he didn't, and you did, we'd be without all these great photographs that we're going to be talking about today. You're absolutely right. I'm very thankful for that. So you go to uh, Pratt Institute, and you study industrial design, as I understand it. What, what did you think you were, that major was going to lead to? You're always, in, in college, you're always concerned about where you're going to go when you graduate. Right. And I was always concerned about that, but, and I thought in some form of artwork, photography not being one of the artworks that I was thinking about, but I, I thought I would be a very good, I thought I would be a very good cartoonist, but in Pratt I was learning a lot about industrial design and I really got to like that and I designed things like the first princess phone or sewing machines or... You designed the first princess phone? I helped design, I came up with the concept of the first princess phone. It's, I mean, does that mean you, you get royalties or something? No, I, it, it would be nice if I did, but we did that uh, along with the other students as a Pratt project. 
And so uh, the, the learning experience that I had at Pratt was actually fantastic. It was a tremendous uh, opportunity to learn design, and that's the most important thing I think that a photographer needs and an artist needs to know is design. And we had many designs that we made as Pratt students. And uh, for example, General Motors was one of the one of the companies that had a room. So they were a lot of that was the most popular room for the designers. And designing a, a car for General Motors was very important. Don't tell me you designed the, uh, let's say, the Corvette or something. <laughs> Nothing like that. And I wasn't really into the cars as much as the other things. I, I really liked designing, um, for example, the first modern playground equipment I designed. Wow. And, uh, but that's still, that's, you know, that's, I've known that must you, be for another show. Well, we've got room for another show. I, I've known you a long time. We don't see each other as often as perhaps we should, but I've never known these things about you. I think the princess phone people need to cough up some money. I mean, this is not right that this thing uh, is out there and, you know, you should be getting... Well, at heavy the time, checks. At the heavy time, checks. At the time, it was uh, sort of an honor to be able to do what we did for, or what I did for Western Electric. Well, I'm glad you look at it that way. I'm sure they do too. Uh, let's move from Pratt and the Princess phone and all that to. Uh, so you leave Pratt, and what and what happens? Are you do you have a job, or you is this when you go to Miami and the Miami Herald is offering you a job? What happened? Uh, my career started in photography in Miami, and I went to the Miami Herald to interview for a job as a sports and political cartoonist. Really? And they wanted to hire me. And that very same day, I went to back to my hotel, which was around Fifth Street, which is South Beach, and I, I guess I saw Howard Cosell standing on the corner. Really? And I, I didn't know him. I knew, I recognized him, but I didn't know him. And I walked up to him. And as I was walking up to him, Muhammad Ali was crossing the street. And they shook hands and they went into the gym, which was the Fifth Street gym. So I followed them into the gym. And Angelo Dundee stopped me and he said, you can't come into the gym unless you pay a dollar. Angelo Dundee, just for our audience, is, uh, was Ali's trainer. Ali's longtime trainer, great trainer and who later became a very good friend of mine. But at that moment... He's saying, he you said, can't come in unless you pay a pay dollar. A dollar. <laughs> and I had my camera around my shoulder, which I had only used up until that point to take pictures of my family or very arty kind of things. And I said, it just came out of my mouth. I said, and I didn't know who he was. He just stopped me. I said, I'm the photographer of Madison Square Garden. It just came out of my mouth. Really? And he looked at me and he said, OK, comedian, come on in. Where did that come from, George? I because mean, I thought of a ca the camera around my shoulder. I thought of boxing being affiliated with Madison Square Garden. And it just came, I don't know where it came from, truthfully. It just came out of my mouth. And it was prophetic. Uh, yes, I, it, it turns out it was prophetic. I just want to jump back one step here. You were going down to the Miami Herald to interview for a job as political and sports cartoonist. I'm just thinking uh, how much fun you, uh, if you had become a political, if you had become her block, how much fun you'd be having right now in this presidential year. We don't have to get into politics, but there's sure a lot of material for political cartoonists. There is a tremendous amount of material every day, especially, I guess you have to really be creative on days when there's no convention going on <laughs> or not th that much going on in the news. That's when you really show how talented you might be when you come up with ideas on a, on a slow day. But when the convention's going on and you have the people and the characters that we have on both sides, both the Republican and Democratic uh, parties, uh, there's certainly a heck of a lot of material to work with. Yeah, there is. So let's get back. You're in the Fifth Street gym. You've talked your way in uh, because you just happened to say and you don't know why, I'm the photographer of Madison Square Garden, and they let you in. Did you pay the dollar, or did they 
<laughs> no, we, Angelo and I laughed at the idea of paying the dollar and I walked in. Actually, if he asked me for the dollar again, I guess I would have paid him because it was certainly worth the dollar. And you started taking photographs of Ali, who I guess at that point was still known as Cassius Clay, was he? Ali was Cassius Clay at that particular point. And, and I, I remember uh, he got into the gym to work out with his sparring partners and I'm holding, I'm, I go right up to the ring and I'm looking at my camera and I see his face in my camera and it was like something came over, to, over me and I'm sort of, I see his eyes in my camera and I say, you know, this is something I like, I could really do this. And as I take each picture that I take, it's not like today where you see it immediately. It's you know because yeah. of the digital, but uh, eventually when I saw my pictures uh, that were developed from film, uh, I you know I, I really liked it. So I I got it. Now what year what what year is this? This is 1966. Okay, so you're taking photographs obviously with film. Um, and you're taking photographs of Ali sparring and working out. And the, these are the first photos of I your loved professional it. I love what I was doing. I, again, I didn't know what the pictures looked like quite yet, but I love what I was doing. It was really uh, a, something that I, I felt I could really, I can really do. So as a, when I went out of the gym, I got into my car and I put the radio on and I hear that Ali is at top of the news, that Cassius Clay, who is fighting Ernie Terrell, um, is the fight will be canceled by the Illinois governor and that was the top of the news. So I, on a hunch, I went back to the Miami Herald with my one roll of film that hadn't been developed and I told them the story about just coming from being with Cassius Clay and they developed the pictures and they said, can we put it over the wire service? So the very next day, one of my pictures that I took was all over the world. Is that this one uh, with him working on the speed bag? That's the picture that I took. And that picture was all over the world in 1966. And next this, day. this is the beginning. That photograph is the beginning of a legendary professional career for you. Well. As I said to you before, before we went on the show, that I've been very lucky. I've been very, very lucky. Even though my wife says that luck seems to be a product of hard work, but yeah. um, it's funny how that works. People who work hard seem to have a lot of luck. Well, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of luck in my career, and uh, so this was basically the beginning of my career. And uh, I, when the when the uh, photo appeared all over the world the next day in the newspapers, um, I, I was quite happy, obviously thrilled. Sure. And I, on a, when I went back to New York the following week, I showed my one roll of film to John Condon, who was the head of boxing PR for Madison Square Garden. And Condon looks at the pictures and he obviously liked it, but it's only one roll of film. And Condon said to me, he said, if you have the chutzpah to come to me with one roll of film, I have the chutzpah to hire you. And that's how I became the photographer of Madison Square Garden. That, that is a remarkable story. I can just see a, what, 22-year-old? I was 24 years 24, old. 24, walking into the garden with one roll of film. And, I, you know, I guess it's a tribute to Condon who, well, first of all, it's a tribute to your grit and ambition and to him to have the sense to look at the pictures and say you're the guy. Well I was also helped to some degree because the photographers that Condon was using was either sick or hurt and I, I just happened to walk in at that moment when he needed a photographer. So um, I was again luck plays an important part Yeah. and I was really happy that when Condon said uh, he he said, "I'm going to hire I'm going to hire you," and for me to hear that from him in Madison Square Garden, which I always loved, uh, I loved to go to the garden. The garden was such an important part of my life to see basketball games, the circus, the hockey games. So, to be the photographer of the garden was a big deal, and I got paid for it too. <laughs> right. So. It seems like you basically invented the job. 
I was fortunate to be at the garden at the right time when Condon, when Condon told me that uh, he wanted me to photograph Emil Griffith and Dick Tiger up at the Concord Hotel for their championship fight that was coming up in another month. It was such an opportunity for me and I was so thrilled. And it was, a, again, it was a way of making a living and doing it in a way that I wanted. Sure. And, and doing something that I love to do. But I think what I'm, I'm thinking about is, uh, they give you an assignment like that one and I guess others, but you're expanding the portfolio and bringing into your, into your world of what you're going to photograph, the Knicks, the Rangers, and I guess eventually uh, the performers who, who appeared at the Garden. Well, once I had the opportunity to photograph boxing and they liked what I did and kind of loved what I did, um, I started to realize that there are many opportunities here at the Garden, including the Knicks, the Rangers, and especially the Knicks. I was a real Knicks fan. And the circus and all the other events that happened there. So slowly, uh, in the course of two or three months, I became the photographer of Madison Square Garden. You invented the job. I invented the job. Okay. So let's go back to your relationship with Ali, who it, it began as Cassius Clay uh, in those earlier photographs we saw, and um, he's the heavyweight champ at that time. Let's jump ahead, uh, I guess about five years, and the fight of the century, or as it was called, is about to happen. Frazier and Ali uh, are going to fight, and you're at the, what, Frazier uh, training headquarters taking, taking photos? Well, my wish for the Ali Frazier fight, arguably the greatest boxing event or sporting event of all time, certainly it was at that time, uh, my wish list was to get the two fighters together in Joe's gym. And I had so many things that I wanted to do, and we arranged that for Muhammad Ali to come to Joe's gym and to do all the things that I planned to do. And the first thing I wanted to do was go around with Ali, and I said, Muhammad, I want you to look into my camera. We're in the ring. He's, right. he's dressed in his trunks. And I, I said, I want you to make believe my camera is Joe Frazier, and I want the world to see what you look like from my camera. And so Muhammad started punching and just nicking my camera or missing my camera by a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch. Wow. But I wasn't, I wasn't a, a fearful in any way because he seemed to have incredible pre precision. And I realized the greatness of his, athle his athletic greatness at that moment because that's, a, a, an incredible, uh, that's an incredible talent to be able to just sure. miss... Just Your miss, not hurt by you. An eighth yeah. of an inch. Anyway, we go through three rounds of boxing. I'm with my camera. He's going like this. And at the end of the three rounds, a bell rings, and he goes, I am the greatest. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I just love it. I mean, how can you not like doing this? Yeah. So then I asked Joe, let's do the same thing. And I started boxing with Joe for about seven seconds. I said, Joe, that's enough. I had no confidence that Joe was going <laughs> to... You thought, yeah, camera. he's going to flatten you. Yeah, I, I felt that that camera was going in my head any second. So I said, Joe, that's enough. He said, what's the matter? I said, because you don't have the precision that this man over here has. Ah. On the other hand, if I was in an alleyway, I'd rather face him than you. Right, I understand. So, Let's look at this photo of, uh, you had them with their two heads together. That's a great shot. Uh, no one had ever done a head-to-head, -head, nose to nose shot before. And I had this, another desire to do this with them. And I got the two guys together and I put Vaseline and water on their face to make it look like they're in the, in the ring fighting that night. Yeah. And I said, come on guys, make believe this is the night of the fight. And mix it up a little bit, let's see what you can do. So Joe started hitting Ali, jabbing Ali in the stomach, and Ali was jabbing Joe, and it, Ali was giving me these great looks. And then all of a sudden, Joe hits Ali with a left hook to the belly, and Ali goes down. Wow. And I, I, I'm alone with these guys, and I'm not sure what, actually what to do. I mean, the world would love to see this. I have the, this is uh, arguably one of the great sporting events of all time, and I have the two guys together in the gym, 
And so I, Ollie's on the ground, I put my hand out, and as I p start pulling Muhammad up, he looks at Joe from the sitting position, he says, your son of a gun can really hit. <laughs> and Joe says, that's the way, Clay, that's the way it's gonna be the night of the fight. <laughs> And Ali goes, ah, ah, and he, I, I helped lift him up. Yeah. And it was quite an experience and quite a, uh, quite a position for me to be in. Sure. I'm unbelievable. Uh, there's, a, there's a shot before they're in the gym, outside with, with, uh, with uh, Ali looking in and Joe... Uh, behind the uh, window with the with the uh, fencing, whatever that is, that's that's just an extraordinary picture, George. When it was time for Muhammad to leave, I said, "One more picture, guys." And Joe had gotten dressed. Muhammad Ali had showered and gotten dressed too. I said, "Before you leave, just go to the other side of this window. I'll turn the card around so you can see what it is." And I said, "Just ham it up. Do it. Do." You know, really give me some emotions from the outside. And Joe, you do the best you can from the inside, because Joe is, was not that kind of showman, but Ali was the great showman of all time. So they're fooling around like that, and that turned out to be one of my best shots that I've ever taken. Yeah, you can see the, the animation of Ali, and just, you know, a very, I don't want to say passive, but it, it, like, like Frazier's just not impressed. <laughs> he doesn't have that in him. That he doesn't have that showmanship. But what he does have in him is that honesty, the, the feeling for always being truthful, uh, but always being serious. Yeah. And Ali had this great uh, ability to be this great showman that he was. And this photograph is probably the most asked photograph that I have. You, really? That, yes. Yeah. You, you developed uh, uh, enough of a friendship with Ali that um, three years after this, when in 74 when there was going to be the, was it the Rumble in the Jungle? The Rumble in the Jungle, right. And you're, you're telling, Ali is uh, asking you about how he should handle this fight? About two months before the Rumble in the Jungle, I get a phone call from Muhammad Ali and he says, I want to come to your office tomorrow uh, at 6.30 and meet you in the garden. I said, what's up? He said, I'll tell you when I get there. So he comes at 6.30 the next day and we go into the, we, uh, we go into my office and I said, well, what's going on? He said, let's go to some place quiet. I said, this is quiet. There's no one in there. There's nothing happening in the garden. The only person here is a security man. Uh, how quiet do you want to be? He said, let's go inside the garden. So what he was really doing was holding up what he wanted to tell me. So we go into the empty garden press room, and I said, so what's going on? He said, in one month or so, maybe a month and a half, I'm going to be fighting George Foreman. He's too big, he's too fast, he's too young, he's too quick, he's too strong. I can't beat him. Ali is saying this, this to you. to me. And I can't believe that I'm hearing this, that he's, he has the confidence to, to even have this conversation with me. And I, I, I didn't know what to say for about 20 seconds. In about 25 seconds, I started talking to Muhammad. I said, you know, all the years that I've been photographing you working out in the gym with your training partners, I said, you know what they do in the gym? what they do in the ring, you lean your back against the ropes and they just hit you, hit you, hit you. And I always wondered, why do you, why do you train that way? Why don't you hit back once in a while? But you just, you just against the ropes and they're hitting you. And I said, you know, the reason you were doing that is because you're practicing for this fight. What wow. you're going to do the night of the fight is lean the same way with your back against the ropes, let Foreman hit you and hit you and hit you. He's going to tire himself out. Act like you're a dope on the ropes. Act like you're doped. And he said, you mean like a rope-a-dope? I said, no, rope-a-dope. That was the first time any of these words were coming out of any mouth. And I said, no, act like a dope on the rope. He said, I like the word rope-a-dope. George said, well, Kalinsky, the author of... Ropado, I, you, you amaze me.
You, you really well, have. So uh, Ali said, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to think about that. I have to talk to Angelo. Well, when he first talked to Angelo, Angelo did not like the idea. But about a week or so later, Angelo, I found out through, through Ali that Angelo changed his mind. He liked the idea right. of the rope of dope because I, Angelo probably figured that he isn't going to win the fight unless he has some other kind of idea. Yeah. And so the rope of dope became uh, a legend that started with me. And I. In an, in an empty press room. In, in an Madison empty press Square room in Madison Square Garden. Well, you know what that suggests, uh, 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 among other things, is the trust that you had um, uh, built with Muhammad Ali. And trust is evident in so many of your photographs. And I'm thinking of one of um, uh, Phil Jackson, of the Knicks, when he was playing for the Knicks. In the locker room, I guess after a game, uh, let's show that picture. And I mean, I don't think, I don't think a player would let, or anybody would let, a photographer take this picture, unless they trusted him. I was very fortunate in my career that a lot of people trusted me. And that, you know what? That's what it's all about, that trust. And so this one night after a playoff game in 1973, and I see Phil Jackson sitting the way he was nude, uh, I just thought it was an arty shot, you know, going back to my old arty shots. And I took that shot. And all of a sudden, when I showed it to Phil, he said, I love it. And it became his, best, his favorite shot. It's, uh, there's a certain quality. I mean, I, I don't want to sound, um, uh, you know, like I really know what I'm talking about in terms well, of art I and photography, because I don't. But that reminds me of certain, like, uh, Roman statues. Well, it's nice to be able to take different things in what you do. I, I, I remember once a basketball photographer told me that he just likes to take action shots, and I'm saying to myself how boring that is. I like to take pictures of as many different concepts and ideas as I can. And when I saw Phil sitting like that, he actually did look like a statue, and I thought that would make a nice already shot. And luckily enough, Phil loved the shot, and it, because of the... Um, shock value, I guess, to some degree yeah. at that time in, in our history. Uh, it was a shot that was very popular, became very popular. Well, there are so many other photographs that we want to show our audience, and I am delighted that you're coming back here next week. Uh, and principally, uh, what we're going to do next week with George is have him tell us about a lifelong friendship that began when a man walked into his office looking for advice on how to photograph a heavyweight fight. That man who walked into his office was Frank Sinatra. We will see you next week with George Kalinske.